All right, so uh, welcome to the Enhanced Power Quality and Reliability class. Uh, my name is Rob Raceman, and uh, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I graduated from uh, University of Florida with electrical engineering degree. Um, also did some uh, graduate studies there. I uh, worked at the Machine Intelligence Lab and did um, research um, on, on autonomous mobile robots at the Machine Intelligence Lab. Um, worked for the electric company in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, JEA, which is the eighth largest electric or municipal electric utility in the United States. Um, and there I worked in the, uh, in the power plants as an electrical engineer. Um, I was specifically responsible for the emissions monitoring systems, uh, which we installed for the uh, Clean Air Act. Uh, and those systems uh, collected continuously um, emissions data from the power plants and reported it to the EPA. Uh, and that's how I got started in, in kind of the real-time data uh, gathering and analysis and reporting, um, which I've been doing for over 20 years now. Um, in 2000, I left the electric company, went out and started my own consulting firm, and uh, have been doing that ever since. Um, so I'm really excited to be teaching this class. Um, I've been in industry, uh, worked on you know practical real-world projects now for, for quite some time, and uh, I see that the, uh, the stuff that, that, that we're going to teach in this class is really uh, the kind of material that's lacking out there in industry. Um, and I think there are a lot of, of really good opportunities for people who understand the things that we're going to teach in this class. Um, and so I'm really excited to be uh, sharing kind of my knowledge and experience w in this with you. And uh, I'm excited that there are people who uh, want to continue and, and do these kind of things. Um, hopefully this inter introductory lesson, I'm going to talk about smart grid fundamentals. Um, it's probably going to be a lot different than any of the other smart grid stuff that you've heard. Um, I'm going to give it to you, uh, you know, from, from a perspective of somebody who's worked in the utility industry for quite some time. Um, I actually started co-oping. I, I worked in the Environmental Affairs Department at JEA. I uh, started co-oping in 1989, so that was my first exposure to the electric utility industry, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, I've also worked, you know, in manufacturing. I worked at, uh, at NASA for Dynex Engineering, did some uh, work on the payload ground handling mechanism that load, used to load the, uh, the um, payloads into the space shuttle. Um, worked in the marine in industry uh, on some ships uh, for the Navy and also for cruise ships um, and, and various manufacturers. Uh, so I've got a lot of different experience in this kind of stuff and I think that, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to pass some of that perspective on to you and, uh, you know, get you excited about this kind of stuff because it, it really is, it's, it's cool stuff and, um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of opportunity out there if you learn it. So um, I'm going to start uh, just talking about the grid. And I've got a slide um, that, uh, you know, kind of a, a simple slide that shows an overview of what an electric grid looks like just for us to talk about here. Um, you know, we've been, we've been operating electric grids. Uh, you know, the late 1800s, uh, Thomas Edison was... Uh, you know, built the first electric grid. He built the first power plant and ran lines down the street and, and let people run electric lights and stuff like that. And, you know, of course, when he started, it was a novelty and uh, they might run the power plant at night for a few hours so you could run your lights and show off to your neighbors and stuff like that. Um, you know, and, and then as it, as it moved on, of course, people wanted the lights on all the time and, and reliability became a little bit more of an issue. And, uh, they they learned through trial and error how to how to make these things work and got a little more complicated and and by the early 1900s by about the 1920s they were starting to interconnect uh, electric grids you know in different cities or different towns might be nearby and they they realized that you know if the power plant in that town went down that it was nice to be able to uh, send some power from the from the town next door and um, you know, so 1920s, we started at like the first uh, interconnected power grids. But, you know, even in the 1920s, it was uh, it was limited to the East Coast. You know, if you lived in a, in a bigger city on the East Coast, you might have some electricity. And if you didn't, if you lived out west or, you know, didn't live on the eastern seaboard, you were, you were pretty much out of luck. I know, uh, you know, my grandmother, who's who's going to turn 96 here in next month in July, 
of uh, 2013. She was born in 1917. Uh, she grew up on a farm in Ohio and, and never had electricity growing up. Um, so, you know, it, it, we've been doing this for a long time uh, it, it, from one perspective, and then from another perspective, we're still pretty new to it. Um, you know, electric grids uh, have always traditionally been uh, kind of set up where you have your, your power plants, you know, that feed the power into the grid, and then you have, uh, you distribute that out to your users, whether they be industrial customers, whoops, uh, whether they be industrial customers or uh, residential customers, like we have over here. Um, and uh, it was pretty simple. And, uh, you know, up until recently, uh, even back in the 80s, um, 80s and 90s, uh, it really wasn't all that simple to collect information about what was going on in the grid. Uh, I know when I started working for the electric company in 1989, um, a lot of the telemetry systems were based on leased phone lines, and uh, the equipment was really primitive. And, uh, you know, you only instrumented, you instrumented the things that were absolutely vital because it was really expensive and really complicated to do. And so there were just a lot of things that you didn't know what was going on. And, and I can give you a real good example of that. You know, just, you, you know, you look at how, uh, how the electric meters are read. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I think most electric meters are still read this way today. Uh, they send somebody out with a, a, a clipboard and they go and they read the dials on your little meter out by your house once a month. And they, they write it down and then they go back and type it into a computer and, you know, if they're really advanced these days, they've got a little handheld PDA thing and they uh, type in your meter number in the reading so that they don't have to write it down on a clipboard and then type it into a computer when they get back to the office. Um, and we're really just now, probably in the last 10 years, seeing automated meter reading systems where companies are putting in radio networks and um, electric meters and they're able to go and automate that. They can go take you know, readings periodically over this radio network. Um, but again, just in the last 10 years, so you think about somebody who's been in the utility industry, uh, somebody who has like a 30-year career in the utility industry, the, the folks that are retiring right now, uh, you know, it's really at the very end of their career that these changes are happening. Uh, and prior to that, the, the electric grid had, you know, been, been this pretty archaic, uh, old-fashioned kind of thing. Um, so I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges uh, that we see, you know, that, that people in the electric industry are kind of struggling with now. Um, and again, that's how I think this talk might be a little different than some of the things that you've heard in the past about um, the smart grid. You know, I, you know, smart grid is one of those things. It's kind of a marketing term almost. Uh, you know, people talk about the smart grid and it's everybody knows that you're supposed to be impressed with the smart grid and it's really advanced and all that. But you know, people don't really think about some of the drivers that are happening, uh, some of the things that are happening in the industry and some of the, the drivers that are driving us toward this. Um, and of course, there are also uh, government um, programs that are encouraging this kind of thing. But um, even without those, there's just there's lots of reasons to be moving toward a smarter grid architecture if you're if you're running an electric utility. Um, so let's talk about those a little bit in relation to these diagrams. Um, so some of the things that are happening, of course, is that, you know, in, the, in a traditional electric grid, like I said, you have the power plants are all here and they feed the power in and then all the users are down here and they suck the power out. Right. Well, you can see uh, we've got the uh, we've got kind of the renewable energy now and uh, renewable energy is wherever the energy is. So, you know, people are putting these photovoltaic farms out where, wherever they can put them and, and people are starting to put the photovoltaic arrays on their homes. Um, they're putting little wind turbines on their homes or they've got wind farms. Uh, wind farm might be in different locations, might be spread all over the place. Um, and so this complicates the grid right here because all of a sudden not only are you you're mixing your, your generation with your, your users. So you've got all your users out here and some of them are actually feeding power back into the grid. Well, if you've, you know, like I said, if you've been working in the utility industry for years, this, this just hasn't been done. And so you're doing something new that uh, you've complicated the grid. You've made it much more complicated now because you've got power feeding in from all over the place. Um, not only that, but you can't control this generation. You know, the sun shines when the sun shines and the solar panels make the power when the solar panels make the power. 
you can't tell them, uh, hey, this is a, I've got 6,000 watts of solar panels on top of this house and I need 6,000 watts in the afternoon because that's when my load is. Um, that's just not how the, the renewable generation works. Same thing with the wind farms. You know, the wind blows when the wind blows. And sometimes the wind can be blowing and then it stops. And you have to react to that. You have to have assets up here that can generate power when you, when you need it. So, you know, right there we've got a big architectural change, uh, something that's not as easy to model as, as the old-fashioned grid. Uh, so right there you've got a problem. You've got something that, uh, you know, you need to collect some information. You need to run it. Um, and you need to measure what's going on so that you can determine what kind of problems you have and start working on solutions for them. Um, in the energy sector, you know, uh, I've got a, a customer, a large uh, phosphate manufacturer down in Lakeland, Florida. Um, and I was down there working for them, and uh, the engineer, uh, one of the engineers had the uh, power bill sitting on his desk for the month before. And uh, so I looked at the power bill. It was over a million dollars for a month. And, it, of course, it's a huge plant. I mean, it's an enormous plant. And they had big motors and pumps and all kinds of stuff. Um, but they spend over a million dollars on electricity. So you, you sit down and you start thinking, man, if I could just save them a couple of percent here and there, um, there's got to be wasted energy in the plant. But if I could save them, you know, a little bit here and there, I could, you know, I could be saving them tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars or, you know, millions of dollars a year even. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the users are starting to be much more sophisticated because the, the cost of the generation is uh, becoming more expensive. Um, I can also tell you at that phosphate plant, they've started generating some of their own electricity. So they have, uh, they have sulfuric acid plants. They're, it's an exothermic rea reaction. It, it generates a lot of heat. And they collect that heat and they generate steam and they run it through a turbine. They make some electricity that they can use for their own uh, for their own manufacturing purposes, but they can also sell that out on the grid. So, again, you know, another complicating factor there. Um, also, the other thing is, uh, as a as a as a power plant operator, as a, as a power system operator, um, some of these plants res uh, represent a huge load on my system. And so. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if if during my peak times I could I could go to these guys and I say, hey guys, uh, you know, how about during the peak times it'd be really nice if I could just turn off your power for a couple hours in the afternoon here and there only during the, you know, the 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 days when it's really hot and it's you know getting getting a lot of usage and you know rather than me building another power plant it'd be a lot cheaper for me to shed some of my load. And so I'd like to give you a curtailable rate, and I'd like to be able to cut off your power, you know, give you a 15 minutes notice that uh, I'm going to cut off your power and, and be able to cut off power to part of your plants. So uh, we're seeing that kind of thing happening. Um, it's just getting on to be a lot more sophisticated.